My name is Al Albertson, although in the service I was known as Holger Albertson Jr. My rank was at the end of the service was first lieutenant. I started as Buck Private and then after I had gone through bombardier school and received my second lieutenant's commission, of course I was second lieutenant and then I could drop my earlier number of 19065851 and become 0772791 with a new serial number and a new start. So I was going to school at that time at Occidental College in Los Angeles. A friend who had come to college with me from Idaho, we had both attended Boise Junior College, which is now Boise State University. And he and I were down in Chinatown in Los Angeles on the Sunday that this happened. And I can hear even yet the newsboys yelling, extra, extra, extra bombs dropped on Pearl Harbor. And that was our introduction to our participation in World War II. He went on to be a Marine and I ended up in the Air Corps. There was a lot of training involved, and much of which I am not sure I really put to use. Uh, first, the boot camp where they taught you to march back and forth and uh, gave you a little more endurance. The next serious training would have been in Carlsbad, New Mexico, after I had been classified as a bombardier. We had numerous practice bombing missions out of that little airfield at Carlsbad. After that, I had an air-to-air -air gunnery school at uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, and uh, some radar training at Boca Raton, Florida. And uh, I think that completed the training. Uh, but uh, some of it, as I say, I didn't use much. Before we went on a mission, I had to know what altitude we were going to be bombing from and I had to know precisely what kind of bombs we were going to be dropping because that was information that I had to set into the Norton bomb site that we used dropping the bombs because uh, each bomb had a different trajectory and we had a nice little book that had been prepared which gave us a setting for the bomb site for each type of bombs that we might use. So that was one of my chores before we started on a mission, was to set that material into the bomb sites so it would be correct when we made our flight. I was flying in a B-29 bomber, which was uh, the bomber used by the 20th Air Force. It wasn't used in Europe, but it was used in Asia and in the Pacific. And my duty there was as a bombardier and gunner on the B-29. The B-29 was called a Super Fortress. It was larger than the B-17, four-engine bomber, each engine putting out 2,200 horsepower, as I recall. And it was a large, pressurized, fairly fast machine. It was a comfortable airplane for the most part because it was pressurized, as was not the case with any of the other bombers that we were using at the time. And so uh, anytime we went above oh, roughly 12,000 feet, why, it was comfortably pressurized. I started, of course, in India and China and uh, flew a few missions during that first period there. N not so many missions because we flew our own airplane over to India. And after we got, had been there about a week, our pilot, the one with whom I had trained, was killed on his first mission acting as a co-pilot for a more experienced pilot. They had attempted to bomb Iwata, Japan, as I recall, from the base in China and got somehow lost over the hills in the Himalayas, perhaps. We never found out exactly what happened to them except that they, we knew they were gone. 
So when that happened, they needed time to get me crewed up with another crew. Next, I think, they crewed the various ones of our original crew up with different uh, airplanes as the positions became available. I was lucky for the first one. I got an old pilot who had been flying in China for years, and uh, that made the trips over the hump, as we call it, over the Himalayas a little easier because he knew the mountains uh, sort of like the back of his hand, and uh, I was more comfortable flying with him than I would have been many others. But uh, then eventually I ended up with a pilot, a good guy by the name of McDougal, was captain, and then yet another one by the name of Kaufman. So uh, part of my uh, experience was probably not like that, uh, not what it would have been had I stayed with the same crew. I almost didn't get to know the people I was flying with because, you know, I hadn't trained with them. I hadn't worked with them as I had the original crew with whom I flew overseas. It wasn't the same experience that I would have had. Uh, so I didn't really get to know the crew members very well. But we certainly performed as a team, and uh, we all knew that uh, each guy's performance was uh, necessary to the, the safety of all of us. And most of the, they were genial, good people. And I enjoyed, I enjoyed the people I did fly with. So my missions in India and China were somewhat limited. We were attempting to bomb Singapore from our base in Piardoba, India, about 100 miles north of Calcutta. It's a very long mission, so what we had done was to put two large gas tanks in one of the bomb bays and bombs in the other bomb bay. We got well over the Indian Ocean down toward Singapore and when they attempted to do, transfer it to the wing tanks where they could use it, we found that the transfer pump was not working. So we couldn't use the gas and that meant we was no way we were gonna get all the way to Singapore or perhaps probably never get all the way back to our base. So we dumped the bombs out and we dumped the gas out and we threw out about everything that weighed anything and headed back toward uh, our home base in India. We got as far as the coast of Burma and uh, one engine ran out of gas and quit. And we flew on closer to the base and lost another one. And we landed with two engines going, and another one quit before we got to the end of the runway, and we had to be towed off by a little British lorry. So we slept in the airplane for a couple of nights and then flew it back to our base in India. But it was a bit of a close call because we, we just nearly ended up in the drink. <laughs> we made missions over to China with carrying bombs and gas, as opposed to bombs, we made a couple of missions from China, from India over to China and supplied the area with a little more material and then we'd finally fly a mission out. So we were spinning our wheels. Then uh, in early April of 1945, we flew our airplane over to Tinian in the Mariana Islands and from there we conducted numerous raids that were daylight raids. Some of them were single ship. Others were in tight formations to bomb factories, this kind of thing. Later, many of them were indeed night missions where we simply dropped all kinds of incendiary bombs. Some of the missions after I moved from India and China over into the Mariana Islands, were night missions and uh, I particularly remember the ones over Tokyo, for example. It would look as if half the city was on fire at the same time and in fact I think it was. It was pretty spectacular and the fire was such that there would actually be a firestorm that would 
come up vertically and make it very rough to fly through because it was almost like a, a well, it was a serious updraft as you ran through the fire if you were one of the later bombers to go in. It was pretty rough and uh, very, it was spectacular. And it also made you wonder what you were doing to those poor people down below. At least it made me wonder that. We were attacked on the night mission over Tokyo. We were attacked by what they called a baka, which I think the word means crazy. It was a suicide airplane flown by uh, somebody who had decided to give up his life for Japan. And their mission was to collide with a B-29 and wipe out one B-29 and uh, I guess lose one small airplane with TNT in the nose. I saw him because uh, they used a, a bit of extra power with a rocket in propulsion to get a little extra speed and I saw the rocket fire and shot him out of the sky at about a hundred yards distance from the nose of our airplane. This was a little mission for which I received the Distinguished Flying Cross. I recall one time when we did need an oxygen mask, and that was when some flak hit over Kuri, Japan, uh, which was a, air, a naval base south of Tokyo. We were doing a daylight mission over it, and it was interesting because the ships that were shooting anti-aircraft at us were using different colored smoke in their uh, bombs so that each one would know where his uh, anti-aircraft flak was going and make adjustments as they needed to. As I recall on that mission, we had a co-pilot that we were, I guess, training. It was his first mission and he was making remarks as if he were on a scenic tour about how beautiful this stuff was. Well, look at that, that color, that, that's, that's purple, that's orange, that's yellow, wow. And uh, I was thinking, this is pretty silly because uh, uh, I knew they had rocks in them and I wanted to tell him so, but I didn't have to because a piece of it hit the brace between two of our windows in the front of the airplane and uh, it showered me and the pilot and the co-pilot who was having the scenic tour with glass. And uh, he, there was a sudden silence. I heard no more from him. Uh, I scared the hell out of me. And of course we had to get the oxygen masks out, <laughs> fly home till we could get down to a lower altitude. One time uh, we, were on the, well, some of the bombs got stuck and didn't, didn't drop, and other bombs dropped in on top of them. I think these were 70-pound incendiary bombs. So we were in the unhappy situation of having, well, perhaps half a dozen bombs that were sitting loose in the bomb bay, and uh, we had to get rid of them, so the crew chief and I went back into the bomb bay and manually lifted these things and threw them out so we could close the bomb bay and, and get home. So that was a little uncomfortable. On each mission, of course, I had to go back into the bomb bay, which was unpressurized and uh, cool, and pull the pins out of the bombs because each bomb had a little pin that looked a little like an old-fashioned hairpin and it was used to uh, disarm the bomb and make it so it wouldn't explode in the airplane. So as we got up to altitude and well out toward uh, our target, I'd go back into the bomb bay and pull all those little pins out of each of the bombs. That way the little propellers that were part of the arming system as they flew, as they dropped down, would be able to spin loose and arm the bombs. About the nearest thing I can think of to a miracle that occurred while I was in the service was that flight where we were in a tight formation 
I think at the time there were probably 12 airplanes in formation, almost wingtip inside wingtip, because that's the way we'd like to drop the bombs and get a concentration of them. And as we were going through clear weather and we just got about to the coast of Japan when we hit some kind of a cloud formation and went into a cloud bank, when we came out of it, we had gone into it, we were on the right-hand side of the formation. And when we came out, I looked over to the left to see how we were doing, and there was nobody there. And finally realized that we had somehow gotten on the left side of the formation and all of the other airplanes were over on my right. And I don't know yet whether we went under them or over them. All I know is we didn't go through them. I had been doing missions up to about uh, probably a week or so before that thing was dropped. And they dropped it from the same island from which I had been flying. That is to say, they took off from that island. But I was on a rest leave in Honolulu. And I read about this in the paper and was very surprised. My first reaction was one of amazement and astonishment because I didn't know I had any such a thing or that we had anything that could do such profound damage to a city. And my next feeling was one of sadness for those people and relief for myself. I figured it probably meant that I wouldn't have to fly any more missions up there. And you know, they've been shooting at me and uh, you get the feeling that if you keep doing this long enough, they might eventually hit you. And in fact, uh, they had hit our airplane a time or two. So relief was another feeling that I had. But I then went back to Tinian and uh, did some training of incoming new bombing crews, or did some training of their bombardiers until we finally made our way home, which we were unable to do until we had a nice little typhoon over there. It's kind of a finale for the, for the uh, overseas thing. Mostly it was just routine. Uh, uh, or it got to, it became routine, although I'm not sure that that kind of work can ever become totally routine. <laughs> but I felt quite lucky to have uh, gotten out of it. I'm alive, I'm 93 years old, and I'm enjoying myself. I flew a total of 22 missions in the two theaters. I don't think back on these things very often. When I do, I try to think of happy things rather than uh, sad things. But uh, all in all, I feel very privileged to have been able to do this and still be here to tell about it. Yeah. All right. Just a little.